petrochemical industry. In the meantime, efforts should be exerted to find a substitute and new sources of energy. Fortunately, we enjoy close cooperation with your country in the field of energy. We also share the same opinions regarding the establishment of an honorable and durable peace, and we sincerely hope that 1978, which begins tomorrow, will be a year of such a peace. With this hope, I propose a toast, Mr. President, for you and Mrs. Carter's health and happiness, for the further pity of the great and noble American people, for the ever-increasing friendship and cooperation between our two countries, and for international peace and understanding. Majesties and distinguished leaders of Iran from all walks of life. I'd like to say just a few words tonight in appreciation for your hospitality and the delightful evening that we've already experienced with you. Some have asked why we came to Iran so close behind the delightful visit that we received from the Shah and Empress Farah just a month or so ago. After they left uh, our country, I asked my wife, uh, with whom would you like to spend New Year's Eve? And uh, she said, above all others, I think with the Shah and Empress Farah. So we arranged a trip accordingly and uh, came to be with you. As we drove in from the airport this afternoon, to the beautiful White Palace where we will spend the night, and saw the monument in the distance. I asked uh, the Shah what was the purpose of the beautiful monument. And he told me that it was built several years ago, erected to commemorate the 2500th anniversary of this great nation. This was a sobering thought to me. We have been very proud in our nation to celebrate our 200th birthday a couple of years ago. But it illustrates the deep and penetrating consciousness that comes from an ancient heritage and a culture that preceded any that we've ever known in our own lives. Recently, Empress Farah gave us a beautiful book called The Bridge of Turquoise. And we get many uh, gifts of that kind from visitors. And for a few days, I have to admit that we didn't pay enough attention to it. And one night, I started to thumb through the pages, and I called my wife, Rosalind, and I called my daughter, Amy, who climbed into my lap. And we spent several hours studying very carefully the beautiful history that this book portrays of Persia, of Iran, of its people, of its lands, of its heritage and its history, and also of its future. It caused me to be reminded again of the value of ancient friendships and the importance of close ties that bind us as we face difficult problems. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. This is a great tribute to you, Your Majesty, and to your leadership, and to the respect and the admiration and love which your people give to you. The transformation that has taken place in this nation is indeed remarkable under your leadership. And as we sat together this afternoon, discussing privately for a few moments what might be done to bring peace to the Middle East, I was profoundly impressed again not only with your wisdom and your judgment and your sensitivity and insight, but also with the close compatibility that we found in addressing this difficult question. As we visit with leaders who have in their hands the responsibility for making decisions that can bring peace to the Middle East and ensure a peaceful existence for all of us who live in the world, no matter where our nations might be, it's important that we continue to benefit from your sound judgment and from your good advice. As I drove through the beautiful streets of Tehran today with the Shah, we saw literally thousands of Iranian citizens standing beside the street with a friendly attitude expressing their welcome to me. 
And I also saw hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of American citizens who stand there welcoming their president in a nation which has taken them to heart and made them feel at home. There are about 30,000 Americans here who work in close harmony with the people of Iran to carve out a better future for you, which also helps to ensure, Your Majesty, a better future for ourselves. We share industrial growth. We share scientific achievements. We share research and development knowledge. And this gives us a stability for the present, which is indeed valuable to both our countries. We are also blessed with the largest number of foreign students in our country from your own nation. And I think this ensures, too, that we share the knowledge that is engendered by our great universities, but also that when these young leaders come back to your country for many years in the future, for many generations in the future, our friendship is ensured. We are very grateful for this and value it very much. I have tried to become uh, better acquainted with the culture of Iran in the preparation for my visit here. I was particularly impressed with a brief passage from one of Iran's great poets, Saudi. And I'd like to read a few words from him. Princess Far Empress Farah tells me that he lived uh, about 600 years ago. Human beings are like parts of a body, created from the same essence. When one part is hurt and in pain, others cannot remain in peace and quiet. If the misery of others leaves you indifferent and with no feeling of sorrow, then you cannot be called a human being. Well, this brief passage shows that there is within the consciousness of human beings a close tie with one's neighbors, one's family, and one's friends, but it also ties us with human beings throughout the world. When one is hurt or suffers, all of us, if we are human beings, are hurt and we suffer. The cause of human rights is one that also is shared deeply by our people and by the leaders of our two nations. Our talks have been priceless. Our friendship is irreplaceable. And my own gratitude is to the Shah who, in his wisdom and with his experience, has been so helpful to me, a new leader. We have no other nation on earth who is closer to us in planning for our mutual military security. We have no other nation with whom we have closer consultation on regional problems that concern us both. And there is no leader with whom I have a deeper sense of personal gratitude and personal friendship. On behalf of the people of the United States, I would like to offer a toast at this time to the great leaders of Iran, the Shah and the Shabanu, and to the people of Iran, and to the world peace that we hope together we can help to bring. On New Year's Day, President Carter meets King Hussein of Jordan, whom the Shah and Shah has invited to Iran. Two heads of state hold talks concerning current political developments in the Middle East.
it is time for the American president to leave. At the airport, officials and their wives bid farewell to President and Mrs. Carter. The two leaders exchange a few final words before the distinguished guests board the plane. A joint communique is issued listing the subjects discussed during President Carter's visit to Iran. The communique stresses the conviction of the two leaders in the strength of the unshakable alliance existing between Iran and the United States of America, based on a wide community of mutual interests. Airport, the Shah and Shah Arya Mayor spends a few minutes talking to the large group of Americans who have come to the airport to see their president. And so ends another important event in the history of friendly relations between Iran and the United States of America.